everyone, and welcome to another episode of Raising Bulls, brought to you by the Beautiful Game Network and Roughneck Scarves. We are the only podcast dedicated to the New York Red Bulls 2 of the USL Championship. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, the first road win of the year. It took them way less time this year to do it than last and the year before that. Uh, Tom Barlow makes the team of the week. Congrats there. We'll look at the Eastern Conference and uh, points per game around the uh, the USL in general. And then we've got two match previews for you. First, tomorrow night or tonight, depending on when you're listening to this, against Hartford Athletic. And then against Loudoun United. It'll be the first uh, baby Atlantic Cup clash of the two USL sides. And then, of course, we'll do our USL news. And we, we even have a question tonight. Those are the days. Uh, joining me tonight, we're, we're switching things up. I've got a special guest host. It's Mr. Liam Pettit. How you doing, Liam? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for calling me a special guest. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's our, my code word to the audience. They know what that means. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about this match the other night uh, against Charlotte. I think um, – Looking at the standings and just kind of understanding how Charlotte's played so far this year, it, it's not much of a surprise that the Red Bulls were able to come out and beat them. But it's definitely a good sign to see this team uh, be able to put together a result like they did on the road. There were some nervy moments uh, defensively. Uh, thankfully, Evan Laura was able to step in and, and keep things uh, on the level. Uh but otherwise, I thought it was a really impressive performance for a young team. Yes, they still haven't played together a ton, uh, you know, throughout the squad, and uh, they got they got their first road result, which took them until October, I think, each of the last two years. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Just getting that off their back right away, it just takes the pressure off going into the summer when those games really get a whole lot harder, and. You know, they're continuing to play pretty well. And there were times in this match where they were overwhelming Charlotte. Constant pressure in the final third. And right now this team is just firing firing on all thirds. on all Firing on all <laughs> cylinders in the final third. And <laughs> it's a tongue twister. It's a tongue I, twister. I think we should uh, shorten that to firing on all thirds. That, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the yeah, parlance. I mean, they are really playing well in all phases of the game right now. And, you know, John Wallenick said after the game, too, like John Christoph Kofi and Chris Lemma have really been gelling together well. Yeah, I think uh, when they've been moving the ball forward, they've done a really great job. And they, they've also pressured really well uh, in the offensive half to create turnovers and create those transition moments, which uh, you know Red Bull 2 thrive off of. I am not as uh, high on, on their play. When you talk about other teams with, a, you know, getting a longer spell of possession, and you know, kind of defending closer to the goal, I think that that you know neither of those guys has a strong enough uh, defensive bite to really close down a lot of um, uh, dangerous attacks, and it's created some issues. They really haven't been punished for it uh, too much so far, but uh, I think that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah, it's going to come. The good thing is that Jean-Christophe Kofi, though, has the build that when the game maybe isn't that sporadic, when he can you know, pick his man, come up from behind him, he's winning these physical duels. And you, know, you look at Christian Caceres last year, yeah, he has that bite, he's really active, but he's not quite the specimen that Kofi is. I agree, yeah. Uh, let's talk about... Uh, Tom Barlow in this match. Tommy is rocking and rolling in 2019. Two goals, uh, essentially the the leveling goal and the the winner in this match. He cannot be slowed down. He probably is a little bit like Bradley Wright Phillips in um, in his best goal scoring seasons. In that he probably could have 10 or 12 goals right now. Uh, but you got to be happy with the production that he's been able to put out there. And he's doing it with his head. He's doing it getting in behind uh, defenses. He's creating turnovers and scoring that way. It's just every facet of a striker's game that you want to see them excel at, he seems to be doing it. It doesn't matter if he's up there alone or with a partner this past week with Jorgensen or, or Brian White the week before. He's just finding ways to be dangerous in the box. And I think... Um, you know, I, we're going to have to see how he progresses throughout the season. Uh, but 
the returns right now are really encouraging. And while the first team is kind of struggling to figure out uh, who's going to be able to be the heir apparent for Bradley Wright Phillips, even if, if he's in the squad, you know, obviously Matthias Jorgensen is one of those guys that uh, we talk about, but Tommy Barlow, I think is becoming a, a dark horse candidate. And if yeah. if he keeps the ball rolling, I think the sky is the limit for him. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> Honestly, because he's playing really, really well in every single facet. He's, I think, probably his best attribute, which I feel bad because when he when I first started seeing him last year, you know, he's a big guy and he can play with his back to goal. I just thought, all right, this is going to be a target striker. He's intelligent. He can run behind the lines. He knows when to make his runs. And he's also good with the ball at his feet dribbling. He's a powerful runner, too. We saw that a couple of times against Charlotte, you know, with a quick turn, just, you know, the ball coming right to him, literally just letting the ball roll over like his plant foot and he's he's off. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's playing on another level right now. And yeah, can he keep it up? That's the question. Um, and you'd like to think he could. And, you know, we saw Brian White get a goal, but he's been, you know, he had an injury early on in the year. And when he got some chances last year with the first team, wasn't necessarily getting on the score sheet, coming in tough moments. So, yeah, I mean, Tom Barlow, if he really continues to light it up, why not? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he absolutely can do it. When you talk about guys who have traditionally been the big goal scorers for this side, uh, you know, you start that list with Brandon Allen. And while Allen uh, scored a lot of goals, so many of them came from the penalty spot. And then uh, you look at a guy like Anatoly Abang, who was tremendously inconsistent uh, for the side. So, you know, if Barlow really can get going, I, I'm pretty excited about what he might be able to come or well, might be able to come might be able to do in, in the future uh last week i talked about against charlotte one of the big things they were going to need to do to break down that defense was uh, keep the ball uh you know running down the wings to the end line and crossing it back low team did that they scored a goal off of it very happy uh clearly the players are all listening <laughs> to the show and responding okay. very well uh, the goal that they gave up uh, was a little bit concerning. I think uh, Sean Nealis probably had his... I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's you know a terrible performance, but he, he probably had his worst performance as a, an RB2 player uh, so far. Maybe you could make the argument for the Memphis game as well. Um, there were just a couple moments where he looked very unnerved, uh, which is unusual for him so far. I think he's been really composed in the back. Uh, but you know maybe some of that is just kind of you know, rookie growing pains, but, uh, overall the, the back line, which has been very good. I thought let a lot of opportunities kind of, uh, come their way. Uh, but by the skin of their teeth, we're able to keep everything out. Yeah. Yeah. And you, like you were saying, the commentators were kind of giving him a hard time and wasn't necessarily having the worst day, but yeah, there were a couple moments there where he didn't look too sturdy, but I think maybe the biggest thing is that Jordan Scarlett is really coming into mm-hmm. his own and just being consistent. And hopefully, I mean, as of right now, he's healthy and that he could stay healthy into the summer. But, you know, looking back at that goal, while that was a run that probably should have been tracked better, I mean, in all honesty, it was a beautiful cross. I mean, Andrew Gutman couldn't have put that in any better. And he's a guy that I think really highly of, and um, that's why he he's a, a Celtic player. Um, yeah, I I don't I wouldn't be too worried about that goal. Um, but you know, Alan Giannis too in in that play was caught pretty high up. Mm-hmm. Probably shouldn't have stepped too far up to that midfielder to let Gutman get in behind, especially the kind of player he is. And you know, I'll give credit to Nicky Jackson too because. It's still a a difficult shot to hit it the way that he did and to place it where he did. Uh, so it's still it still was an unusual play, uh, but maybe those guys should have done better all around. Um, okay, let's talk about man of the match. Who you got? I, I want to be fancy and try to pick somebody out that that you know had a low key good game, but it has to be Tom Barlow. 
uh, I think he deserves it. And, you know, throughout the game, he, he was a menace for Charlotte's back line. So, uh, yeah, got to give it to him. Yep, fully agree. Tom is uh, putting the team on his back uh, and really powering the offense, which is something that Red Bull 2 really haven't had since Brandon Allen uh, was leading the line and, and doing what he was doing. But again, I'm, I'm more impressed with what Barlow has done so far because he is finding lots of different ways to score and uh, obviously having a lot of success doing that. He should have one more goal, <laughs> but that game was canceled. Oh, well. Speaking of which, uh, the Red Bulls 2 announced today that that match against the Birmingham Legion has been rescheduled for October 16th at 8 p.m. That's going to be one of the last two games of the season. They'll play three days later at Loudoun. Uh, sort of, uh, well, I guess not coincidentally, because they're they're playing them in those two moments. But uh, a, a good way to end the year against you know uh, two new teams that are going to be struggling to pick up points. But, of course, it's on the road. Let's turn our attention now to the power rankings for the week from USL. I'm just going to go through the top 10 and then uh, compare that to what we see for points per game. Uh, So they've got Tampa Bay, number one, Nashville, number two, St. Louis, three, Phoenix, four, Red Bulls, two, five, New Mexico, six, Indy, seven, Portland Timbers, two, eight, Sac Republic, nine, and North Carolina FC at 10. Now, Bearing that in mind, uh, the Red Bulls, too, are leading the league in points per game. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I should say it's not close, but 2.5. Uh, the next team down is St. Louis with 2.17. Then Tampa Bay and Nashville at 2. Uh, oh, and India at 2. And then uh, it continues to drop further down. I'm not really sure why the Red Bulls aren't higher on the list. I think they've done very well against uh, team, well, the team that should have given them the most trouble, which was Nashville so far. But they're winning the games that they should. They won on the road. I think they deserve a little bit more credit than they're getting from USL. But I also understand why they want to push a team like Tampa Bay uh, or you know Nashville or St. Louis because uh, those those three teams are doing great stuff. St. Louis is, for me, the surprise of the beginning of the year. No doubt. And look, I mean, if they they win these next two games, I don't know if they should necessarily be any higher. Uh, even if, you know, some other teams drop off in their form, when they right. get to play Indy 11 and, you know, when they play Tampa Bay later on, that's going to be the real test. And then you, you could say they deserve to be at one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, Tampa Bay, let's give a shout out to Andrew Tanari for scoring a heck of a goal this past weekend. Uh, a curling effort from outside the box. Always glad to see that guy uh, achieve. He was one of my favorites while he was here. Yeah, it was a banger for sure. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a break now. It's short first segment, I know. But uh, when we come back, we've got two matches to preview. And uh, that's against, again, Hartford Athletic and Loudoun United. So stick around. And we're back. Yes, it's a short show tonight. We don't have a guest in the middle, but we have two matches to preview. This first one against Hartford Athletic tomorrow night or tonight, depending on when you're listening. Hartford, I'm just going to put it plainly, are not good. (laughs) They are 0-6-0. They've got a negative 11 goal differential. Uh, Their last five games, losses to uh, Bethlehem Steel, Tampa Bay Rowdies, Indy 11, Louisville, and Charleston, 3-1, 4-0, 1-0, 2-1, and 2-1. Uh, it's just, uh, their, their defense is real bad. We'll go over that in a second. Uh, their leading goal scorers, there's three guys who have scored goals for this team. Jonathan Brown, Jose Angulo, he's a former Red Bull player back in 2012, and Philip Resmussen assists. John Kempin, the goalie, has one, and Jose Angulo has the other. Uh, like I said, Angulo spent time with Red Bull in 2012. He was coming from, I think, FC New York at the time. I think that was also the year John Rooney was on the team. Uh, he, but he's a heck of an attacker. Uh, all things attack for Hartford are flowing through Angulo. 
Uh, he had a great goal um, the other night from uh, probably about 40 yards out. He took the ball down out of the yeah. air, turned, and, and just hit a beautiful shot. Um, he spent time after the Red Bulls with the Pittsburgh Riverhounds, Fort Lauderdale Strikers, St. Louis FC, and OKC Energy. He scored 51 goals and 111 appearances across those teams. Head coach, Jimmy Nielsen. Everybody will remember him as uh, the goalkeeper for Sporting Kansas City. Also, the last Sporting Kansas City affiliated uh, person who was kicked <laughs> kicked at by a Red Bull player. Of course, that was Janino. <laughs> far less, far less lethal kick, <laughs> I, I will add. But Jimmy Nielsen fell down uh, in a way that made it seem much worse than Kaku's. <laughs> I'll give him that. Um, they've got Loney's from Columbus, the aforementioned John Kempin, Louis Argudo. They play very direct. They've got 40% of their passes are going forward, very similar to the Red Bulls, uh, but their defense is a mess. If you watch their, their matches, there's a lot of ball watching uh, when teams have the ball in the final third. They struggle to clear out balls just in general uh, when they win them back, and you, this is really the death knell. They're not good at defending uh, crosses in. And they're not good at uh, playing the ball on the ground. And when you can't do either of those things, you're going to leak goals, which they have. My unscientific uh, uh, poll back and forth, it's, it's actually surprisingly close in terms of uh, their uh, their stats against the Red Bulls. Uh, but they have given up a tremendous amount of goals. They've only scored three. And they've given up 14. That, that's a rough ride. Liam. Watching this team, what's something that stands out for you? Yeah, they're just not good defensively. They're just not experienced back there. And when they come up against teams like Red Bulls 2 or you know any of these top-level USL teams, they're going to struggle. It's going to be a rough year. It's the first year in their existence. And look, Red Bulls 2, they're sorting out some things themselves, even though they're playing really well. This is a good opportunity for them to, you know, bang some more goals and and you know test themselves, try some new things as well if they want. Yeah, well, I think they're going to be forced to because they've got uh, three games over this this week. They played the gaming in Charlotte and then obviously two at home. Uh, so they're going to have to to work on some rotation. I think you'll see a little bit more time from Kyle Zayetz, uh, Preston Kilween, who got his uh, first appearance with the club last week. We didn't mention either of those guys. Uh, McSherry and, and Kilween both got into the match last week. Uh, and uh, Amarildo. So there's a couple of guys I think that you're going to see rotated in. I'm not sure if they're going to put them in against um, Loudon or Hartford, uh, but I think it's a good opportunity to get these guys who haven't really seen too many minutes into the match. Maybe even, right, like you said, experiment uh, with a little bit of a different look. They could maybe play a possession-based game and still succeed wildly against this Hartford team, I think. Um, but one thing that I want to uh, keep an eye on is how they're going to they're going to deal with Jose Angulo out on the left side. Alan Giannis got beat last week. I know it was only uh, uh, that one time where they were really punished for it. Uh, but when you got a guy who likes to go forward and Angulo, who is a, a really crafty attacker and good at setting the ball in and, and taking on players, he's going to have to be a lot more defensively responsible. And whoever plays in front of him might have to uh, hang back as well to kind of lend support when needed. Yeah. Alan Giannis you know, playing, you know, he hasn't had much playing time with Red Bulls to this season, uh, not too many minutes. A guy that maybe if you wanted to, it's on a short week, who's very athletic. I think he has the ability to go forward. He likes to get forward is a guard Arito, uh, who can maybe slot in there and keep up with a guy like Angulo, who is pacey and is going to test the Red Bulls back line, no matter how poorly Hartford is going forward. Yeah, I think that is a good idea to bring Rito into this match. Um, what else? What else should we talk about? Okay, uh, when you look at uh, the the sort of um, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for here? Their resume. When you look at how they've they've played against these other teams, uh, despite the fact that they're losing these games by multiple goals, they are creating a lot of chances. Uh, 
like I like I had said about Angulo, um, yes, he's leading the line, but I think in general they've been able to to do some impressive things. This is a team that, despite the fact that they've only scored three goals, have taken more shots than the Red Bulls too, and that's highly unusual in the USL. The Red Bulls are usually taking a crazy number of shots per game, uh, so. What I worry about for the Red Bulls against a team like this, yes, their their defense is bad. Yes, they have trouble clearing the ball. However, if they're able to get the ball forward and and snatch one, they could then sit back and, and maybe try to uh, see out the game that way. I still don't think they'd be able to do it, uh, but it's definitely something that could happen against the Red Bulls, especially on a week where there's short rest. Yeah, and it's a home game, so you would like to think that Red Bulls 2 are going to come out and – be energetic, but yes, there's always uh, the chance that this could be a trap game. You're playing a team that obviously know that there's a lot more quality within your side than theirs. But yeah, like you said, there's guys, Angulo has 10 shots on the year, Mads Jorgensen, another Jorgensen <laughs> that could see a time on the field, has 12. So, I mean, Hartford could just be taking a little bit of time and to get into the swing of things, they may not be the bottom feeders that we think they're going to be. But, you know, again, it, it all comes down to discipline. And it doesn't matter the opponent, especially at home. They have to try and avoid a letdown after a good week against Charlotte. Yeah. And the, the final X factor there is uh, you have a team who's desperate. And desperate teams can put together results sometimes. I think we saw that a little bit with the uh, the Red Bulls and MLS this past weekend. Uh, so, you know, you can't necessarily just look at the fact that they've lost six games and say that this is going to be a walkover. They're still going to need to do their job. And uh, and I think that they're more than capable of doing it. Uh, but it, 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 it could get a little dicey there. Something I'm looking forward to seeing, though, is is Matias Jorgensen going to play again with Red Bulls, too? And Looking at him against Charlotte and especially with the first team beforehand, you know, not very good performances for a guy that Red Bulls have high hopes on that spent a lot of money on. And, you know, he's still getting, you know, getting used to the system, getting used to, you know, the the change moving over here to the U.S. But, you know, will we see him again? And, you know, this is a good opportunity for him to maybe get some goals and then back in the net and, um, you know, it could be just a short run out for him, but who knows? He could play in this game and then feature with the first team in New England on the weekend if they they want to do that. True. And, you know, to be fair to Jorgensen, I, I think he took a lot of criticism on how he played the last match. Uh, I thought that, you know, his running and um, maybe a disconnect with his teammates – uh, to me, that was more on the familiar uh, familiarity of the team with Jorgensen and having played with him uh, more than it was really an issue with what he was doing. And, you know, he nearly did score a really nice goal from outside the box uh, that was well saved. So I, I, I'm a little bit more uh, optimistic in what he did on the night. But, you know, it's clear that I think there's still a long way to go with him and uh, the fact that he's with the two team tells you that I think the coaching staff realizes uh, it's got to be baby steps. Yeah. Too soon to pass on any judgment. Again, he's, he's running hard and it's going to come. Yeah. Uh, Let's get a prediction from you. Let's go. Let's go three, nothing. Okay. I like that. I'm going to say two to one. I don't know why, but I feel like they're going to score, and I, I always think that the the former Metro players are the ones that are going to do it to them. <laughs> As you are aware, that would be. It's a very gold team prediction. Oh, I was waiting yeah, for you yeah, to say that would be so exactly. Metro. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, let's look at the other game this week: Loudon United FC. This is DC United. They are. Also winless on the season, uh, but I think just in terms of, of what they've been able to do, they're a much better team uh, than um, Hartford. They are 0-2-2 two two with a negative four goal differential. They lost to Nashville and Ottawa. Each of those matches was a 2 nothing scoreline. They drew against Memphis and Tampa Bay. I, that second one is an especially 
Um, surprising result. They only have one goal. <laughs> Griffin Yao, he signed as a homegrown player for D.C., right after he scored at that goal for them and the assist came from Kyle Murphy. Uh, the, the biggest things about this team, they are very young, just like the Red Bulls. These guys are, you know, fresh out of the Academy, uh, and super, super green, not a lot of experience. And you see that in some of the goals that they've given up. I think, uh, in their first match against Nashville, it really stood out. There were, you know, they give up a goal on a set piece where the the keeper mishandles the ball, uh, and then a very similar goal from open play that kind of has those same notes. So it's it's another one of those things where you see these inexperienced players kind of freeze in those moments where they look like they're trying to just. Um, uh, block space in the box, and that allows the the offensive player to kind of you know uh, pick their shot or, or buy a little bit of space from the defender and and uh, curl it in. But you know, like I said, I think defensively they're a lot more responsible. That shouldn't be a big um, surprise for anybody. Richie Williams, the coach, the ankle biting midget of death. Uh, if <laughs> uh, you are familiar with the parlance. He was always a tenacious midfielder. The couple of times that he was a caretaker manager for the Red Bulls, uh, he got some very good results, particularly 10 years ago uh, when he took over for Juan Carlos Osorio. Uh, the, the piece de resistance of that season was a drubbing of Toronto FC, which forced them to miss the playoffs that year. But uh, he's got a young side. He's He's keeping them, I think, together the best that he can. But this should still skew towards the Red Bulls in almost all of the categories uh, that I normally check. Uh, tackles, duels won, aerial duels, uh, goals conceded. The Red Bulls, too, have pretty much, you know, down the line taken the kick. But like I said, I think that this team is absolutely capable of putting in a stout defensive performance. And you got to see what's going to happen with the the rotation again for this match. I think... Uh, the, the guys who started against Charlotte, for the most part, that have put in the most minutes should get rest midweek and be back at it for the weekend. But we really don't know yet. Yeah, and it's another home game. Like you said, Loudoun United, a very young team, a team that you know could have played in League One for their you know early infancy and then made their way up to the championship once the the system was cemented and. They have a lot of young guys. Griffin Yao is a guy that, you know, just watching his highlight tape, he's a very exciting talent. And DC United over the years have produced some exciting players, and you're starting to see some of these guys come into the first team. Donovan Pines, I think if he would be playing with Loudoun United, if he didn't have as high of an upside as he does, you know, maybe he's down with Loudoun United. Um, and, you know, we've seen guys like Chris Durkin come through there. So, Loudoun United, they're, you know, the the talent is going to come through there. It's just, it's really early right now. And they're, they're just going to have to get things sorted out for the moment. And they have a talent-rich um, academy and sort of area to scout. But one thing to keep an eye on as they develop is that they are one of the few MLS uh, academies that is still a pay to play academy and that could alter things uh, should the um the restrictions on uh, regions be lifted for where you can start grabbing youth players from um yeah you know there's not a ton to talk about with this team we've we've covered it all on the red bull side i think in this match again they should be able to break down uh loudon especially with the the height that they have if Tommy Barlow is playing and, and Kofi set pieces haven't been great for the Red Bulls this year, but I think against a young and uh, inexperienced side like Loudon, they should be able to, to clip a goal or two. Um, but I think it, it definitely skews in the way of the Red Bulls too. at home, inexperienced team. They should get the win. What do you think the score will be? Liam? I'm more inclined now to go a little bit more conservative with my prediction. And I'll, I'll say 2-1 Red Bulls. They, they get two or three, you could say, uh, on the whole week undefeated. Okay. I'm going to say 
this is a one nothing win. I don't think it'll be as uh, nervy as the Charlotte match, which was a one goal win. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of frustration from the Red Bulls trying to get uh, something uh, together. I think Loudon is capable of, of kind of stymieing them for a bit, but ultimately they'll be able to take the match. All right. So we, we're going <laughs> all Red Bulls all week. We think they're going to do it. Tommy Barlow made the bench of the team of the week this week. Santi Moar, player of the week. I'm just going to go through the the 11. John McCarthy in Tampa Bay. Uh, Wesley Decas at Atlanta. AJ Cochran, Phoenix. Josh Yarrow for San Antonio FC. In the midfield, Jamel Johnson. Santi Moar, Kevin Carr, or Kevin Kerr, rather. Chris Wien for New Mexico. And a forward, J.J. Williams for the Birmingham Legion. And Casper Prisbrugle, I can't say that last name. I'm very, very sorry, Casper, uh, for Bethlehem Steel. Uh, a little disappointed we don't see Tommy Barlow in the starting 11, but J.J. Williams and, and Casper, whatever his name is, uh, had really strong weekends. Honestly, we'll, we'll probably see him very soon in that, that graphic. It's really all it is. Yeah, that's true. I am one of the people responsible for voting on that graphic. And uh, Tommy Barlow wasn't even on the uh, the shortlist this week. A little disappointing. Uh, we did the power rankings before, but now we can look at the standings just from top to bottom. Uh, we don't have to talk about this too much. I'm just going to go through the list. Leading the league in the Eastern Conference, St. Louis with 13 points. Tampa Bay behind them with 12. Nashville, New York, and Bethlehem all have 10 apiece. In that group, uh, the Red Bulls have a game in hand over Nashville, three games in hand over Bethlehem, and two over Tampa Bay and St. Louis, who are above them. They're in a real good way. Uh, We didn't mention it before, but this is the best start a New York Red Bulls two team has ever had. And I imagine they're just going to extend that against two weaker opponents this week. Oh, I forgot to mention Atlanta United in that last group. They also have 10 points. Good good on them for turning it around. Last season was really, really poor for them. Yeah, there's talent there. It's I, Last year was kind of a disappointment. I thought they were going to be a lot better than they were. Yeah, I mean, look, they have guys that I think they're, are good and can play well there. I think being able to lean on Romario Williams a little bit has helped because he's got a, a, tr- a ton of USL experience and a great nose for goal. Um, but... You know, we'll we'll see how that that goes for them. Uh, under them at seventh, Indy eleven nine points. North Carolina FC at eighth eight points. Then the Riverhounds also with eight points, and then rounding up the top ten, Charleston Battery with eight points. Below the line, it's Ottawa, Louisville City. Still a surprise that they're down there. They are winless in their last three. Birmingham Legion, Memphis nine oh one, Charlotte Loudon, Swope Park Hartford. So I guess look. I was complaining about the power rankings before, but look at that bottom five. Memphis, Charlotte, Swope Park, three teams yeah. the Red Bulls have beaten. All right. All right. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll calm down a little bit. <laughs> uh, and yeah, bottom is Hartford, 0-6-0. Just a really, really poor start to the year. I think they could turn around. They've yet to play a game at home. So I'm going to give them a little time. Uh, any thoughts on the the Eastern Conference? Yeah, I think <laughs> it's crazy to see Swope Park so low, especially because of the fact that you know I think the theme of tonight we're just talking about all these teams that are underperforming, yet they have some good young players. Swope Park is has guys that you know could potentially we could see in uh, Sporting Kansas City first team very soon. Uh, they didn't look all too bad against the Red Bulls either. And, you know, uh, of course, Louisville City sticks out. Yeah. Um, other than that, I, you know, it, it's it's really early on. And Louisville, there are two wins this season, one over Atlanta United, which is doing pretty well. But I, I thought at the beginning of the year we were, we were ready for them to be poor again this year. Uh, and the only other win that they have is against Hartford. They've lost to Birmingham. They've lost to Pittsburgh, and they just drew Tampa Bay. Uh, I don't think there's really anything to be ashamed of in those results. The the Birmingham one at home, maybe. Maybe a little bit. Uh, especially because the, the goal they gave up was so late in the match. Mm-hmm. Um, but Pittsburgh and, and Tampa Bay are, are quality teams. 
it was cool to, to hear the guys that were on the show last week, you know, very enthusiastic about getting a, a team in Birmingham and very, very proud. You know, I'm, I'm rooting for them. I want to see them do well. Yeah, absolutely. I love those kinds of markets for USL. I think that is perfect. Get them outside of like the traditional places and especially places that overlap with MLS teams. We see it in our own market that it's hard to get uh, people excited about the club and get them out to the matches when they have two MLS teams in the area. And we know that they're having attendance problems. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a tough, tough sell. So I'm glad that a, a team like Birmingham is doing well so far. Uh, in the Western conference, Portland Timbers two still at the top of the Western conference, 13 points followed by New Mexico. Also with 13 points, Sac Republic and Tulsa Roughnecks each with 10 uh, behind them. Then LA galaxy two with nine Fresno with nine Reno with nine, Orange County, 8, Real Monarchs SLC, 8, and Las Vegas Lights, baby. They are above the line. (laughs) Two wins in their last three matches, one over the Monarchs, which I was very impressed by, and a 5-0 drubbing of the Tacoma Defiance. Uh, Way to go, Las Vegas. Maybe Eric Winalda has finally woken you up, the sleeping giants that you are. And all of your shenanigans will uh, also see you into the playoffs this year. More llamas. More llamas. (laughs) Uh, And then below the line, San Antonio, uh, Colorado, uh, Colorado Springs Switchbacks, OKC Energy, Phoenix Rising. They got their first win this past weekend, so I wouldn't necessarily look into that. All draws before then. Tacoma Defiance, Seattle Sounders uh, continuing their poor uh, run of form from last season. Uh, they are now the Tacoma Defiance, in case uh, that was not clear. El Paso Locomotive, Rio Grande Valley, and Austin Bold FC. Austin Bold are the Hartford Athletic of <laughs> the Western Conference, but they have a win uh, over San Antonio, so uh, beating the in-state rival gave them their only points, or sorry, three of their four points this season. Uh, any thoughts on the Western Conference? I just like the fact that Portland Timbers 2 is really just an extension of the first team, and you're seeing guys play down with Timbers 2 that are MLS talents through yeah. and through, and New Mexico United, I mean, of course, I mean, just coming in right away. And you know, I like the brand. I like, again, we were just talking about underserved markets. And, you know, you don't, New Mexico is totally an unknown commodity. And they look like they have a good atmosphere down there. And, you know, Tulsa Roughnecks, very, you know, I, I'm not used to seeing them this high up. Yeah, that's definitely weird. I think with the Western Conference, uh, talking about New Mexico United, um, it's it's very similar to what you see in MLS, where the teams out West uh, are a little bit more possession-based and uh, look for like a more attacking flow. And Santi Moore has just fit in so nicely there. He's so good with the ball at his feet, and he's he's a tricky player to deal with. He's got uh, a great shot from outside, and the Western Conference teams are taking notice. I prefer the the more rough and physical Eastern Conference, more direct and vertical. Yeah, no. agree. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I mean, all you got to do is look at the USL finals for the last couple of years and know that uh, – despite the fact that the Western Conference is putting together some pretty soccer from time to time, they just don't have what it takes to, to get over the hump to beat the East so far. Maybe this is the year. We don't know. <laughs> if Portland keeps bringing down uh, some of the guys they are, maybe maybe it is the year. Uh, it'd be great to see Valeri in a USL Cup. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, okay, we have one question tonight. Um, this comes from third and goal. I asked on Twitter, if anybody wanted to send us questions, third and goal responded. Good on you. Third and goal, uh, bit of a random question with so many former RB players around both in USL and in general, do you think Red Bull two players get enough playing time before being let go? And are there any players you think slip through the net? What do you think? Uh, I'll throw this to you first. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really valid question. And I think, you know, we see Andrew Tenari go, and he's a guy that would have stayed on nearly any other USL team. But with Red Bulls, too, you know, the, 
the whole idea is like, can you fit in with the first team? And if you don't really show it within two seasons or three seasons that you can make that jump the next year and contribute, then you kind of have to move on because you need a whole new wave, you know, coming through, whether it's through the the college level and we're even seeing now more Red Bull Global being incorporated. We're seeing guys come through from Brazil and, you know, it's, it's a really good question. I think that some talent does go through the cracks, but are these guys that are going to end up playing in MLS? I don't think we've seen that yet. So, um, while it's a bummer, I, I don't have a problem with how Red Bulls 2 is operating at the moment. Yeah, and I, I speaking to that specifically, you know, you, we've seen a ton of talented central midfielders struggle to get up to the first team. And it's you, you got to think that, uh, you know, previously they had to be uh, better than Sean and Tyler, which is a really, really hard ask, I think, of a lot of these guys, despite the fact that they're very talented. Are they going to be able to climb that hill? Christian Casares arguably might fall into that group if Tyler didn't leave. I think it would have been very hard to get him into matches, uh, but he has that opportunity now. And I think the Red Bulls were, were aware that that was going to be uh, something that they were going to have to deal with even as early as the beginning of last season. And that was part of why Caceres came in the way he did. But yeah, you, you know, there are a lot of guys that uh, are extremely talented that get let go. But like you said, I don't think a lot of them are going to be MLS players. And as far as uh, playing time, there hasn't really been a guy, I think, that has stood out as being someone who isn't getting the time they deserved with the team. I think John Wallenek and staff have done a terrific job of always giving the players chances. They put them in positions to succeed, I think, on a regular basis. And, you know, I, I they let the play on the field do the talking. And despite losing a lot of talented guys throughout the years, I mean, so many talented players that are still playing in USL, it's not – it's not for a lack of, of playing time that, that they're unable to kind of get over the hurdle. I think it's just if the depth on the first team, despite the fact that they're having difficult results right now, is very, very strong. And you have to be a special kind of player to be able to get up there. Aaron Long kind of fell into a perfect sort of gully uh, for the Red Bulls to make the jump that it, the way that he did. And I think they planned it with Sean and Tyler, but with Aaron... Had um, Damien Paranel been healthy at the start of the what was that the 2017 season, yeah. I don't think that you would have seen Aaron Long, you know, grow into the player that he became. So the question for me is not if they're getting enough time at Red Bull Two before they're being let go, but the guys who have the MLS potential, if Red Bull are giving them opportunities in MLS as often, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, and I think. You're starting to see it more on the offensive side, and I would like to see it a little bit more on the defensive side. One of the main things that I like about Red Bulls, too, when you talk about uh, minutes and whether guys get enough playing time is that you really don't know who's going to be on the team sheet. You don't know who's going to be starting. And over the season, there's a lot of different opportunities for John Wanek to mix things up and... Guys get their chances. It's just a matter of, you know, what can they do with them. And uh, sometimes it's very clear with Red Bulls, too, what guys can take it to the next level or can earn another look the following year and who can't. And you talk about attackers and how that's kind of an area where, you know, we really haven't seen that unfold a Red Bulls two player, you know, really come up through the ranks and then become a mainstay in the first team. And I think that that's more of a epidemic problem across the American soccer landscape in general with, you know, just the premium of foreign talent at the attacking positions. And we see more talent coming through on the defensive end and more specifically central midfielders and, and, and outside backs. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's coming. And I certainly, if you, you know, 
look back at former Red Bulls 2 players and current ones, I don't think it's a lack of playing time that's maybe not getting them above that to that next level. It's it's more of a, a bigger and thematic problem than it is just you know one episode or, or one team. I think that is a perfect way to put a bow on this episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> if you want to follow us on Twitter, I am at underscore Joe Goldstein. I'm at Liam Pettit on two underscores, I think. Two underscores? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody else. <laughs> like you need a social media manager, son. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you'd like to follow the show, and we hope you do, we are at Raising Bull Cast. That's one bull, Raising Bull Cast. And that's all on Twitter. You can also follow our work at the Red Bulls News Network at rbnn.us and RB News Network on Twitter. We're on Facebook.com at Facebook.com slash Raising Bulls. We're on RaisingBulls.com where we put all of our episodes. You can send us questions there at questions at RaisingBulls.com. That's questions at RaisingBulls.com. Uh, we're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, we are there. If there's a service that you like to listen to that we are not on, please tell us. We will get our show onto that service by hook or by crook. We're part of the Beautiful Game Network. They're covering MLS, USL, Premier League, and NWSL across a host of great shows. I'm only going to list off some of the USL shows. I try to make a habit of this every year. I finally updated the list. There's a crazy number of uh, podcasts that were added over the last year. Uh, Start with the USL show, Backyard Footy, The Last Line. Those are all just sort of general USL shows. You have Bethlehem Blast Furnace, The Birmingham Backline, Back Chat, Sirius Loco, Fox Trot Pod, and so much more. They've got so many great podcasts. If you want to stay up to date on any team in USL, well, maybe not any team, but most of the teams in USL, go to bgn.fm. They have a ton of great content and a ton of great written content uh, that they began to sort of filter in this season. And of course, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Roughneck Scarves, the official scarf supplier of MLS, USL, and US Soccer. Get custom scarves for your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. For myself and Liam Pettit, thank you very much and have a great night. Okay. Cool.